Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to dust off your imaginations for me. I want to take you back to the early 1790s. I want you to picture western Pennsylvania. Rural, little hamlet here and there, lots of cornfields. Corn's very important to this economy in western Pennsylvania. You have freedom. No real government regulation. The law is a local militia, your neighbors. In this environment, I want you to now see a war hero, a striking figure on horseback, leading a column of thousands of troops into this bucolic area. The hero, striking figure, someone you all recognize, served with General Washington in the Revolutionary War, now is an officer in the national government and serving his country at the head of these troops. In honor of the Broadway show that bears his name, we're talking about Alexander Hamilton, <laughs> right? Hamilton at the head of his troops. Unfortunately, soldiers, and I was one at one time, so I know a little bit about this, aren't the best behaved as they should be. We see locals roused out of bed, many force marched to Philadelphia, stand trial and face accusers. The army has to travel on his stomach, got to eat. We see impressment of foodstuffs from the local population. And Hamilton knows that's going to be a tough winter for the people. Those were in the fall. And in western Pennsylvania, in this type of society, what you have in your larder is what's important. It's going to carry you through the winter. Larder's going to be a little bit empty this year, thanks to the army. We see this, again, round up the usual suspects, troops moving in. They're putting down a rebellion, a whiskey rebellion. Now, why are the farmers so upset in this lovely area? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's because they've been lied to. Hamilton, writing as Publius in the Federalist Papers, promised that an excise tax would only be used in grave times of danger, would not be part of a typical government program, an exceptional measure that would be pulled out when necessary. Well, of course, when he assumed his office as Secretary of the Treasury, an excise tax on whiskey was first and foremost in his financial plan. No great emergency, pushed it into law, and the Federalist legislature passes it. People were upset. They'd been lied to. They'd been duped, and they were rebelling. Now, of course, that's just one lie that we see from Hamilton and some of his cohorts. For example, freedom of speech. The people were told when Hamilton was arguing against a Bill of Rights, along with James Wilson and others, that why would we need an amendment to the Constitution that says a national government cannot regulate speech? There is no delegated power, and if we give you a Bill of Rights, well, perhaps someone could imply the power over speech, and it would be dangerous. And all the Federalists nodded in agreement, yes, yes, absolutely correct. Well, fortunately, the anti-Federalists, Republican individuals, pushed hard. And we do have a Bill of Rights in our Constitution, and the First Amendment does protect speech. But despite this added protection, just a few years later after the Whiskey Rebellion in 1798, we have a Sedition Act. Anyone criticizing the national government or President John Adams could face two years in prison and a $2,000 fine. And not just face, people were put in jail. Actually, a sitting congressman, Matthew Lyon of Vermont, sent to prison and fined for political speech. Yet again, another lie the Federalists foisted on the people. Well, what was the biggest lie of all? The biggest lie, I would say, 
is that the Articles of Confederation, our first charter of union, were impotent, were worthless, should be disregarded, thrown in the dustbin of history in favor of a more energetic alternative. When we determine if a program, a policy, or a constitution is effective and works, I would submit to you that we look to the goals. Were the goals set out met? Let's talk about the Articles. What were the two goals of the Articles of Confederation? One, defeat of the superpower that was Great Britain. The United States of the 1700s. Cornwallis surrenders to Washington at Yorktown, effectively ending the Revolutionary War, though there would be further skirmishes and eventually the Treaty of Paris. Number two, to preserve self-government in the individual states across the Union. Number two was certainly met as well as we see the various states former colonies enacting new constitutions via popular sovereignty where the people exercise their constituent power. A beautiful picture of communities forming, states forming, and the people governing themselves. Not some distant parliament in Westminster, but in their own state and local assemblies. Therefore, I would submit to you that the Articles of Confederation were a great success and should not be something that we're ashamed of or forget, but we should be proud of. You say, well, that's well and good. That's some interesting history. What possible impact or influence would this have on us today? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you some macro and some micro applications from the Articles on how we can build bridges to liberty in this new century. First is the idea of the states as mediators. Under the Articles of Confederation, each state retained its full sovereign power over every matter not expressly delegated to the Confederation Congress. The Confederation Congress could not act on individuals. The Confederation Congress, the government of the center, could not tax you directly. If Congress wanted money, it had to first go to the states, to the state legislatures. In the state legislatures, those individuals closer to the people were familiar with local circumstances, what sort of taxes the people could bear. They were supposed to gather the money, provide that to the government of the center. Think about that great role of mediation there of the states. How about you today? Our national government requires you to purchase health insurance. If you don't, you get fined or taxed, whatever the Supreme Court wants to call it. You look at a number of other programs. If you choose in your private life um, to use marijuana for medicinal purposes or recreational purposes, it's the federal government that chooses to stop you, to come after you. And we could go on and on of other minute matters that is governed from the center. So we have that one, mediation. Let's look at another facet, our national debt. About $19 trillion, right? Approaching 20. Under the Confederation Congress, and the Articles of Confederation, before money could be borrowed, you needed to have a supermajority vote. Supermajority before you could borrow money. How nice that would be for us to have today when you consider the debt ceiling is raised over and over and over. And the old joke, oh, well, we only owe it to ourselves. Well, ask the Chinese about that, right? Uh, no, that's farcical. Uh, that's a huge calamity. We're soon approaching a tipping point where our gross domestic product will certainly not bear the spending that we do and the borrowing. It's a serious matter, but on the articles, there was a club for fiscally responsible individuals and the government to fight back reckless spending. We don't have that today. 
Another example would be rotation in office, what we call term limits today. Under the Articles, an individual could only serve three of every six years in office. Then you had to go back to private life. Why did they want that? Well, they didn't want some careerist legislature. They did not want to create an aristocracy that was separate from the people. They recognized the idea of the doctrine of shared burdens. If you are to make the laws, then you should live in private amongst the people who suffer under them, so you will feel the sting as well. Term limits under the Articles, another thing that we should look at today. Now, those are big picture macro issues. But there's also micro issues, what we can do in our own individual communities. Well, what might some of those be? Well, one would be education. Anybody here happy with the state of public schools? Are you happy with the directives coming from the Department of Education? Very few are. Well, what can you do about it? You don't need a new program, a new policy. You can take your children out of those schools and you can educate them yourselves at home. You can enroll them in a private school where you've reviewed the curriculum and you approve of that. The world of the Articles of Confederation and the Anti-Federalists was a world of small is beautiful. Small units of government where the people exercise control and govern themselves. You can still do that in many areas. Education is just one example there. Another example is get involved in your local policies and politics. Rather than sitting at the diner and having a cup of coffee and complaining about uh, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, or whatever national initiative, involve yourself in local politics. At the grassroots level, there are many things that can be done where ballot initiatives can be used to roll back regulation and government power. Taxes can be capped and cut and other liberty-inducing measures passed at the local level. It's not all about the big show in Washington, folks. There's a lot you can do here in your city of San Francisco and in other places. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with this thought. Don't buy into the lie that our Constitution of 1787 that replaced the Articles of Confederation is the greatest American gift to humankind and political science that you can imagine. It's not. Go back further in our history. Look at the truly decentralized system that we were given in the Articles of Confederation. Look at what a success that Constitution was. And look in your own communities how you can make them better by decentralizing power, looking to your state and local assemblymen, and on your own initiative, seceding, if you will, from government schools and other programs where you can direct your life in a liberty-centric way and make a better future for us all. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.